Hey, welcome to The Journey Church. We're an online church for people everywhere. And in this episode, we're gonna take a look at a passage that is taken out of context very often. People tend to try and make it say something that it was never intended to say. And to help you understand it, you're gonna meet a retired police detective and he's gonna talk with us about the importance of evidence and witnesses in order to prove a case. He's also gonna share some funny stories. After 30 years in the service, let me tell you, he has some stories. So I was telling Thad about a case that we had many years ago. We had a gentleman that was well known to the police department. He uh, so well known, we probably should have got him his own coffee cup at the station. But uh, he uh, he came to us one day with accusations about a particular pillar of the community, and what a what a difference! You hear, here on one side you have a pillar of the community, well respected. On the other side, you have a guy that we routinely had to pick up for mental issues and stuff. And as time goes on, nobody believed him. Nobody ever would believe him. If you had any idea who this guy was in his history, it was pretty much a no-brainer. But uh, we started investigating. One thing led to another, and pretty soon... Well, we'll get to the rest of that story and more from Bruce in a few minutes. But first, let's talk about the number one mistake that people make when they read the Bible. It's pretty much the norm for people to grab their Bible or open up the Bible app and start into a passage of Scripture and they're wondering what's it going to say to them. In other words, people approach the Bible with an agenda. I'm reading this passage or studying this book of the Bible to find out what it means to me, to see what the scripture is saying to me about marriage or money or parenting or pick your topic. The problem with this approach is you've already started off on the wrong path without even thinking about it and maybe not even being aware of it. You're setting yourself up to misunderstand the Bible. And the reason for that is this. When it comes to understanding the Bible, context is king. Over the years, I've used a simple fourfold framework that is really helpful for reading and understanding the Bible. And I wanna share the four steps with you and then we'll take a quick look at each step and then we're gonna circle back and dive into that passage that I mentioned earlier that gets taken out of context almost all the time. Here are the four elements or four steps that are involved in this process. We'll just run through them quick and then break them down. Number one, context is everything. Number two is observation. Number three is interpretation. Number four is application. All right, real quick. Number one is called context is everything and it's for good reason because it helps you remember right from the start that it's critical to approach the Bible with an eye for the original context. You have to remember this was written by real people in a real time and place in history and what they wrote was intended for real people in that time and place, like they had an audience in mind. And so with those things in mind, we can look at the next step. And step number two is observation. So you read a passage and you're asking observation questions. Where did it take place or who wrote it or who or what did they mention in the particular passage? Then we go on to uh, step number three, which is interpretation. And this one is all about wrestling with what the passage might actually mean. What are they saying? What's the main idea that the author is conveying? Who are they writing to? Uh, what would they have thought that this meant? Uh, what cultural factors might affect what they meant? And it's really good to, to keep these first things in mind. It's only really after wrestling with those first three things that you should actually even move on to take time and think about the fourth one. And the fourth and final step is application. 
which as you can guess is all about thinking through if there's any personal application uh, for you in this passage or for other people based on what you've learned from the scripture that you read. So you're going to be thinking through things like, was this just relevant to the original audience or are there principles being taught that are still applicable today? So just a quick look at that study method and you can see how far off a person can, a person can get with just a quick reading of a Bible passage or a story and then jumping right to application, right? They, if people can go, okay, well, I read that story and I think it means this and so I'm supposed to do this. And man, can you really get off the path when you jump too quickly to application? Okay, with that in mind, let's take a look at a passage that gets taken out of context a lot. Here's the verse. It's from Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, and Jesus says, For where two or three gather together as my followers, I am with them. Another translation has it recorded this way. For where two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. And it's really common for people to reference this passage when they're in a small group. They're basically trying to say, hey, uh, remember that the Bible says when two or three are gathered to, together, uh, Jesus is with them. It even gets used by pastors that have maybe a smaller church or not that many people show up for church or a meeting. And they might say something like, uh, hey, we might not be the mega church down the road, but even though our numbers are few, we should all remember what Jesus said when two or three are gathered and they go on to use that as an example. But here's the thing, if that's what Jesus meant when he said this, then by default, he was also saying that he's not there when there's only one person gathering or praying. The truth is that this statement by Jesus has nothing to do with God being present when two or three people gather uh, together or gather to pray. Jesus is actually talking about something very specific and people miss it all the time. In order to discover what Jesus was saying here and help you with all of your Bible reading, I want you to start thinking more like a detective. And what do detectives do? They search for evidence and witnesses and they interview and ask questions. And all of it is aimed at trying to figure out the facts. So to help us get a better idea of how a detective thinks or approaches things, I want to introduce you to a good friend of mine, Bruce. Check this out. Hi, my name is Bruce Fager, one of, that, one of Thad's victims, and you too may be on camera one day if you get to know him very well. <laughs> I was probably 19 or 20 when I started in law enforcement. Met some guys with the Moscow Police Department, and they talked me into joining the reserve unit. My career uh, took me through a bunch of different paths, but it was always in the same town. Worked in a college town, which was a lot of fun back in the day, and uh, worked 32 years. Um, retired after having a just a real rewarding career. Obviously, being a police officer, one of the things we had to do was build a lot of cases, and uh, and uh, you know. To get a good case with successful prosecution, you got to have evidence. Um, you got to be able to corroborate that evidence. You have to be able to prove something's true. Just just your word anymore doesn't uh, doesn't hold a lot of weight. Used to back in the day, um, a little bit, but uh, more and more you have to have video proof, uh, forensic proof, all kinds of, of uh, corroborating evidence to to the story. You might say. Um, and it was always frustrating knowing that somebody did something uh, 
especially on the fairly violent crimes, but not being able to fully prove it or taking months sometimes to, to get around to proving it. Pretty frustrating for the police officers, frustrating for the public, um, but rewarding in the end when you put together a good case. Uh, the better the case, the, the uh, uh, less, we time, less we had to spend time in court. It, uh, very rarely did we have to go to court if we did, did a good job. So. So if you knew, if the defense attorney was trying to just belittle you and make you into a, you know, a loser, <laughs> if he's trying to just destroy your credibility, your character, then you knew you had a good case. And sometimes the more personal the attack on the police officer, the better the case was in terms of physical evidence. Well, um, the type of cases that you'd have, I mean, some of them were the no-brainer cases where you've got a ton of evidence and lots of witnesses and, and, and uh, you don't have to think about it very much. Um, and then you've got the type of cases that are a he said, she said type of deal or uh, something along those lines. Um, they can be much more difficult because we have to be able to, to corroborate that, that that accusation and uh, oftentimes people got pretty frustrated when they would come to us with with an allegation but there was zero there was just no uh, um, evidence to speak of and uh, we always like to follow the evidence um, and uh, evidence speaks for itself when you've got a uh, um, when you've got a case where somebody makes an accusation, um, it was not uncommon that when the evidence got done, done with it, that it pointed a different direction in the case. So um, as far as hearing false accusations against people, happened all the time. Um, and you get to the point where you can weed out the good from the bad and, and figure out what's a, what's a righteous case and what's not. Uh, multiple witnesses obviously uh, help things. Um, when we have a, a situation where there's a gob of witnesses, um, you can get uh, put things together pretty quick. Unless, of course, it's in front of a bar and everybody's been drinking and everybody's got a different perspective. <laughs> Even though they saw the same thing, it can get interesting. But overall, um, uh, Having the, the witnesses that can corroborate things uh, helps helps with prosecution, helps with uh, just about everything. And the nice thing is that most people are are pretty uh, willing to to do the right thing and and say what they saw. One thing about a career in law enforcement is that um, you uh, get to a point in your career where you think you've seen it all and then somebody proves you wrong. Um, th there are cases where people will come to you with a situation or an allegation and you just will not believe it. It, it doesn't seem humanly possible that X, Y, and Z happened, and as you start investigating it, even the most seasoned police officer can sometimes be kind of set back on his heels to, to uh, prove up a case or to, to see that the evidence leads that yes, in fact, X, Y, and Z did happen. We had a gentleman that was well known to the police department. He, uh, so well known, we probably should have got him his own coffee cup at the station. But uh, he, uh, he came to us one day with accusations about a particular pillar of the community and what a, what a difference. You hear, here on one side you have a pillar of the community, well respected. On the other side you have a guy that we routinely had to pick up for mental issues and stuff. And as time goes on, nobody believed him. Nobody ever would believe him. If you had any idea who this guy was in his history, it was pretty much a no-brainer, but uh, we started investigating 
one thing led to another and pretty soon um, the evidence was just irrefutable that this pillar of the community was taking advantage of this guy in some various manners that we'll keep out for family reasons but the uh, it, uh, it it's one of those cases that just opens your eyes and shows you the the importance of uh, of uh, good physical evidence and how powerful it can be. Get a little more heat going here. We uh, had a hit and run one night. This one's kind of funny. The uh, guy hits a parked car. Owner of the parked car is chasing him down the street as he's driving off, calling it in. I just happened to be around the around the block and intercepted the guy, got him pulled over. The front of his car is mashed in, hood's crinkled, steam coming out, windshield's all spider webbed. I walk up to the guy. Of course, this is two o'clock in the morning and he is drunk, bad drunk. But he did what most people do at two o'clock in the morning when they're talking to a police officer, they do their level best to try and act sober. And I'm talking to him and he's trying to act like nothing had happened. Meanwhile, I could see the airbags had just deployed, blown out the front windshield, all this stuff. And he's acting like nothing ever happened. If he stays cool, I won't notice anything. The longer I talk to him, the more I start to notice little, uh, little pieces of bread in his beard and, and little red and yellow streaks here and there on his face. And I'm looking around the car red and yellow streaks and, and uh, stuff on the airbag. And I'm talking to him, and then, then it appears to me, I look over and I see the jack-in-the-box wrapper on the seat next to him. About that time, he tips his head back, and his nose is completely impacted with hamburger and hamburger bun. When he hit that parked car, he was force-fed a hamburger at 200 miles an hour by that airbag. <laughs> I think it's the fastest anybody's ever eaten a hamburger. Now that we're thinking more like a detective, let's circle back to what Jesus said and take a look at it in the surrounding context. For starters, it's good to remember that the paragraph headings uh, in your Bible were not part of the original text. They're formatted to flow in our English translation. So don't get hung up thinking that just because something is in a different paragraph, that it's not part of the main idea or topic that's being addressed in the one before or after it. Instead, there's a good trick. You can do a quick 2020 scan to get a better view of things. So scan 20 verses before it and 20 verses after it. And then you can ask yourself things like, is there an obvious start or end to that segment? In the passage that we're gonna look at in Matthew 18:20. We go back into the verses, oh, 12 through 14, and we can see that things go from talking about lost sheep and God caring for us like a shepherd, and he doesn't wanna see any of his sheep lost. And then in verse 15, it's a brand new idea. So we know it's a start of something new. It's all about a believer sinning against you, and that same topic flows all the way through to verse 20. And all of that subject matter there is talking about how to deal with sin in the church. So let's take a look at it all together. So Matthew 18, 15 through 20 goes like this. If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. But if you're unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and then go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then, if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. I tell you the truth, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. I also tell you this, 
If two or three of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. So this has everything to do with addressing sin among Christians in the church. In verse 18, there is this assurance that when Christians follow this process, God is working in it. It's the part where Jesus says, I tell you the truth, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. And then in verses 19 and 20, you get this kind of final assurance from Jesus. And he says, I also tell you this, if two or three of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. The context of where two or three are gathered together in my name has to do with church discipline and how Christians are supposed to confront a wayward sinner. So when we start digging into this passage and kind of thinking like a detective and following the evidence, what ends up happening is it leads us back to this principle that God established all the way back in Moses' day. And it's recorded in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. It goes like this. The passage says, You must not convict anyone of a crime on the testimony of only one witness. The facts of the case must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Pretty glad we have that rule. So when Jesus is teaching his followers about how to handle somebody in their group or church that's sinning, it seems like he's bringing up this principle and putting it in play. And so he's like, if you know another believer is sinning, it's okay to first go to them on your own and encourage them to stop sinning and repent. And if they hear you and they confess their sin, then voila, it's all over. That's a big win. Uh, great news. But if they don't really listen and they keep on in their sin, then Jesus says it's time to bring along one or two other people with you. And why would you do that? Why would you bring those other people with you? Because the next step in the process is if they won't repent, you bring the whole situation before the church. And that's where this idea from the Deuteronomy passage comes into play. Because you can't have just one person accuse someone of sin. But the principle is if there's two or three witnesses who agree, that's sufficient to establish the matter. So Jesus is teaching that when the sinning brother or sister in the church is confronted by these two or three witnesses, and if they don't repent, and those witnesses bring the matter before the church, Jesus is saying essentially that when this happens, it's not just the witnesses who are bringing the action against the wrongdoer. He's actually saying that he's there with them. So dealing with sin among believers in the church is sanctioned by both God the Father and Jesus the Son. And that's important because we live in a world where it is not very fashionable or popular to confront or judge anyone's lifestyle as sinful. Remember, we're not talking about just anybody. We're talking about Christians in the church. And Jesus' words in the passage remind us that those who do step forward to call out sin in the church can take heart in the fact that they're not acting alone. Christ is with them in that endeavor. And the process of church discipline calls for two or three, and that seems to be the best application for this verse. The two or three who gather in Jesus' name are not coming together in a prayer meeting or a worship service, but in a matter of church discipline. The two or three witnesses have confronted the sinner in a spirit of humility and love, and they're looking for that sinner to repent, but if they don't, then those two or three take that matter to the Lord in prayer, and then they can confidently move forward in the process outlined in Scripture, knowing that they're not being bullies and they're not being busybodies. They're, they can know that, that God endorses their efforts and Jesus is with them in that process.
Hey, I wanted to thank Bruce and his wife Tammy for their hospitality. Uh, we hung out with them a lot while we were filming this episode. And I want to leave you with a little message from Bruce about reaching out and thanking a police officer. The world has changed a lot and the actions of some have made it much, much harder for almost every police officer, security worker around the world. And so I was gonna leave you with a couple of words from him and uh, think about reaching out and saying thanks to those that serve. We'll see you next week from wherever we are out there. A lot of police officers uh, do things that are um, never really seen by the public and uh, they don't get a lot of thank you for it. Um, uh, it is appreciated when they get a thank you, when they save a life, whether it's a medical call or on a serious accident or something like that. Um, to a lot of the police officers, it's just another day in the, in the job. Um, and occasionally they get recognized for doing some good stuff, but uh, um, they do appreciate the good citizens that'll talk to them and, and the, and uh, um, they might come off as a little bit guarded at first because the, the, you don't know what they've been dealing with for the last few hours on their shift or the last whatever, but uh, um, it's kind of weird. Uh, one minute you'll be dealing with a suicide and the next minute you'll be dealing with a minor traffic ticket. You just don't know where they're coming from on any particular time, so. Um, Shout out to all of the police officers still working. I know I've been there, done that. I know exactly what they're going through. So have keep the faith. You can say damn. That's like the biggest part. That's like you can say damn. Part. And frankly, I don't give a damn, but D-A-M, not D-A-M-N. <laughs> because it's a damn? Yeah. Was that what that was about? Yeah. Come on, I was thinking about the whole time I was walking up here. I was like, damn, I gotta say something really good. You're working up a damn joke? <laughs> yeah, come on. A damn good joke. Kind of a spillway. You got any spillway jokes? Listen, the only way I'm spilling is... <laughs> I don't know what I was going with that. <laughs> uh-huh. All right, here, I'll let you do your side. <laughs>